Hi, Jennifer. How's it going? Doing good, Digna. How are you doing? I'm great. I have caught up on some really good um, movies and documentaries, and I um, just wanted to share them with you. Awesome. Let's hear. What's going on? I, I watched Tenet, and that was a good one. It's a sort of mind-bending, mind-numbing, I don't know what you would call it. Right. It's, it's very interesting. One of my favorite actresses, Indian actresses, actually was in it. So I was super stoked. And then I also watched Antebellum, which is- That's um, a horror movie. It's not horror. It's not horror. Um, they make it seem like it's horror. It's a thriller, more so. Okay. It's not scary by any means. Um, it's a- um, it's by uh, Key, um, what is his name? Um, uh, Key and Peel, uh, Jonathan Peel, I believe, is is uh, is the guy he directed of uh, you know Get Out and and Us and some. Uh, those are just really neat, interesting movies. Different perspective on the you know, African American plight and whatnot. Okay. So this I'm is not going to have nightmares. No, no okay. nightmares. This is a. Um, it's basically, it's, there's a lot of, it's about racism um, and social inequalities and whatnot. So it's a really interesting perspective. I really liked it. Um, I thought it was really different. So if you haven't had a chance, it, this is, it's, it's a right time to watch that movie. The, the movie came out at the right time for sure. Uh, so, and know. then The Social Dilemma, you watched that one, didn't you? The Social Dilemma with, um, about social media. Oh, we just started okay. watching it. Yeah. We just started watching that one. So I haven't, yeah, I haven't a, finished it yet, but yeah. So it's a good one. It's, it's interesting because they're talking think. about social media and these algorithms and, and how you're being fed exactly what, you know, um, you're wanting uh, the most of in a sense. So you don't really get a, a different perspective or a conf conflicting perspective and how that kind of messes with your brain a little bit. Well, um, which, speaking of your brain. Yeah. Today's guest is going to talk to us about our brain. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So we have Dr. Ankur Patel. He's a, he has a PhD in neuroscience. So we're super excited to speak with him. So without further ado, welcome Ankur Patel. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we were just talking a little bit about you and we're super excited to have you join us. Um, you know, a lot of our um, listeners are, have been laid off or um, let go of their, their jobs due to COVID and many other reasons. And, you know, losing a job has its setbacks and uh, in mentally as well as physically. Uh, I'm sure people have wondered, you know, what happens to your brain when you are let go from your job, uh, how it impacts your mental and physical well-being, your relationships even. So Dr. Ankur Patel, PhD in neuroscience, um, uh, we're excited for you to share your insights on uh, ways that we can refocus our brain uh, for a healthier brain, uh, brain, as well as help you know, navigate through some of these tough times. So, Ankur, welcome. I promise you we won't uh, you. call you doctor anymore since you requested <laughs> it. Uh, but tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, sure. So happy to be with you, uh, with you guys. Uh, uh, love that I'm, I'm here and uh, hope to leave some value for your, for your, for your listeners. Um, yeah, a little bit about myself. Um, so I've been spending, I spent probably uh, a little over, so like 18 years or so going back to college and everything just um, in some fashion just trying to move the needle in understanding you know how the brain functions how it comes together uh, how do how do these brain cells talk to each other you know uh, what what influences them uh, how does it become this hundred billion neuron you know, rich sort of network uh, that enables us to, you know, create art mm -hmm. and create poetry and just, you know, innovate, consistently innovate, um, you know, and then also fall in despair, right? Which is something that we're going to talk about here today. But, um, it, you know, it, it's, a, it's a remarkable system. It's a one of a kind system. It's, you know, yesterday, it, it, today's system is nothing like it was yesterday's. So, um, that's just been some of my, my interest and I've done, um, uh, you know, I've really stuck to doing a lot of the basic understanding of it from a, uh, on, you know, recording from 
single cells and just understanding how one cell talks to another cell. And um, I've spent a lot of time then sort of thinking that if we were to uh, modify a certain gene that was representational of a particular neurological disease, how does it change the system, right? And what are the limitations when you miss something like that? What, what are the limitations of that particular connection uh, compared to a normal one, right? Um, and um, yeah, so I've uh, currently uh, been in the in, uh, industry space. I work for a big pharmaceutical company um, in, the, in the medical space. Um, we, uh, a big part of what I do is medical education of existing neuroscience drugs that we have uh, to physicians. So I spend a lot of time just talking with physicians and coming up with new ideas, but also thinking about how these products can benefit particular types of patients because it's, it's never going to work for every patient uh, per se. So um, yeah, that's a little bit about uh, my expertise. Uh, the folks that have been laid off, what that means are jobs um, in, in terms of neuro association and the perspective around that. Yeah. So um, I think it's, it's, it's very, it's very important to simplify this whole process. And I think uh perspective always helps. And, and I think that that's where, if you, if you truly come to understanding how we learn things in life in general, if you come to sort of understand that a little bit, you'll, you, I think what we'll walk away with here is understanding that, yes, I learn, you know, p- pleasure, pleasurable things in life. And then I also learn, you know, some of the scarier things in life and, 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 and fears and et cetera, uncertainty, you know, some of those things. So, I'm going to step back like really, really far back. So you go back to late 1800s, there was a really groundbreaking, really observation that was done. So there was this Russian physiologist, Ivan uh, Pavlov. This is, this is another example of like, you know, just how accidentally, how we sort of really run into some of, some of these uh, innovations. But he was, he had, he, he was doing some uh, assessments of dogs. So, so there was a, uh, you know, a dog that would just basically hang out on this particular platform. And he was a, uh, Pavlov was a physiologist, so he was not interested in neuroscience. So it was 1800s, nobody really was. But at the time, he was just sort of measuring dogs, uh, you know, heart rate and that sort of uh, activity uh, in certain conditions. But then he sort of noticed, you know, uh, when when the dog had to be fed, he or maybe one of his associates opened a door where where the, the dog's food was. Now the door, the door was actually connected to a, a, a bell. So every time you sort of swung that door open, you could hear that bell would go off. And after like a few days of this sort of happening, so, you know, the dog's there and they're doing some experiments, dog has to be fed, you go in, open the door, bell rings, and you grab the food, you bring the food, you feed the dog. After a little bit of this happening over and over, Pavlov started noticing that the dog, every time the door was opening uh, where the bell was being rung, as soon as the dog heard that bell, the dog started salivating. So Pavlo sort of thought that, huh, somehow, even before the food ever gets to the dog, the dog is, is already salivating every, you know, when, when it hears this bell. And so he then essentially even did uh, did a few experiments where he saw that where he didn't even bring the food, essentially just rang the bell. And at any time of the day, I rang the bell and he's noticed that the dog again was salivating. And so there, that's where then he identified um, in a very accidental way that, that, huh, there's some association that just happened here where now the dog anticipates the food after hearing the bell. Because what happened is that recurringly the bell and the food sort of came at the same time. And so now every time the bell was happening, it was ringing or being heard, the dog was thinking like, well, the food's got to come. The food's going to come for sure. So the, the first sort of example of what association is, a neural association. Um, and this, I think, really took, took a next leap probably about 20 or so years later, a behavioral scientist called uh, B.F. Skinner. And he essentially 
uh, identified that, uh, you know, he, he simplified the experiment and, and he came up with what is called a Skinner box. So now the Skinner box was basically somewhere where you could put rodent and we, we utilized sort of rodent animals in, in some of these behavioral experiments. A, because, you know, rodents actually have a very good genetic homology to us. And I know people don't want to hear that, but we actually have uh, almost a 90 plus percentage genetic homology to, to rodents. The only thing that they, they really lack is that they don't have some of the higher cognitive functionings that we do. So the evolutionarily, we've sort of advanced in that scenario, but they've become a very good affordable model to uh, understand how the nervous system really functions and how the nervous system really develops because they don't live that long, right? So rodents essentially will live a couple of years, like three years or so. So you can sort of study like, their entire longevity of their lives in a very fast way. Um, but coming back to Skinner box, what Skinner did was essentially he took Pavlov's idea of association, like, okay, yeah, I guess, I guess, I guess if two things kind of happen together, then if you take one of those, then they're going to create this anticipation of what's coming. But he took Pavlov's idea and he set out to sort of say, well, if, you know, the fact that you had the um, bell uh, come with the food, it created a positive association, right? So that's something that the dog wants. And that's why the dog was salivating. So the salivation is a, a positive anticipation of something that, you know, you want and like that. That's what was happening. But so Skinner thought, you know, what about, what if, what if we could create a situation where, you know, you had the bell come with something the dog wouldn't like. So let's say if it's like a vaccine shot, <laughs> so a dog wouldn't like to take a vaccine shot every time a bell was going to be. So in that scenario, it would elicit a negative feeling. So that would be a negative association um, compared to the positive one. But he simplified it in a sense where Sk Skinner sort of did this, where in, in this box, he put two levers in the box. So uh, a rodent could essentially hit uh, either one of these levers. And right in the middle of those levers is, you know, one of like a, a spout where something would come out as a response to the mouse hitting either one lever or the other lever. So in a, in a very simplistic form, one example was if the mouse hit lever A, then it would get uh, water, right? Let's say, for example, we'll get water. So water's okay, not too bad. It's a neutral sort of thing. But if it hit lever B, then it would get a sugar pellet, right? So what Skinner started to identify was essentially that the longer the mouse sort of stayed in that box, and experience a lot of that box, the mouse would start learning that, hey, when I hit B, I'm actually getting a lot more pleasure, right? When I hit B, I'm getting something different than I'm getting A. And when I hit B, it's something that's actually stimulating me more in a pleasurous way. So you can sort of count, right? How many times when you put the mouse in there, how many times does it hit the B one versus the A one? And you started noticing that, oh, wow, it's really hitting that B one. And you could actually, take that mouse out, come back a few days later, put it back in that box. And the first thing it'll do is go for the B. It goes for the B. Like it just says, like, it's like, yes, I, it remembered. It remembered that B was where you get the sugar pellet and A was not the, not where you get that sugar pellet. Now, now also on the flip side, you could have a negative response. So if, if one of the levers was giving the mouse and we do this, but like, you know, it sounds kind of cruel, but, um, one of the levers was sort of inducing a, a foot shock, for example, in that box, then you start noticing that that mouse avoids that lever, right? After a while, it learns like, oh, we don't want to go for that one. Like we want to hit this something else or hit that other one very less. So this was a very simple model that we could then identify, like, you know, where, how does, how does pleasure get learned and how does lack of pain also get learned, right? Um, and that, that's, that's fundamentally, I think, something to keep in mind that everything you know, and I thought this was a great revelation on my part because I was thinking every experience you've had in life, think from your childhood to high school, to college, to your home, and then to your job. All of this, if you were to think of it as a Skinner's box, right? You're, you're the mouse now, right? So you're essentially 
in this Skinner's box going through life in its entirety. And, and in your case, you don't just have two levers. You have a lot of levers, right? You, you, I mean, you're, you're hitting one lever and you realize, oh, I don't want to go there because I'm not good at this sport. Uh, it, it doesn't bring me pleasure. You go to, you hit another lever, you have a certain different kind of experience and that is pleasurous to you. So you stick to that lever. That becomes part of your understanding of where pleasure comes from. You know, so you walk through life going through all these different Skinner boxes and hitting all these different levers. And then you end up at where you are in your job where you then sort of start think about what is, what are the good things that, I, that this job creates for me, right? Um, you hit all those levers and you keep hitting those levers and that becomes your career. Like, oh yeah, this is good for me. I love this. Um, and then there's going to be the, some of the things that maybe you don't like. Um, but, but that's, that's, that's kind of like the fundamental basis of what neural association means and how you learn from your experiences about what's pleasurous and what isn't pleasurous. Yeah. So Does that make sense to you guys? Yeah, so you're saying then instead of a new lever being introduced during COVID, it was just like a big giant dump on top of, uh, in the <laughs> <Yeah>. box. <laughs> and yeah, like, yeah, no. <laughs> and COVID, look, I think COVID, when you think about COVID, COVID is like, it really changed the box, right? I mean, it's, that's what it is. It's, it changes your context. A lot of people went from being in, and, and let's just say that, let's just say that you even kept your job. You kept your job, but you went from a certain, you know, certain other kind of box that was your office. And, and, and the box is not just, you know, location. The box is also that when you were in your office, the world was a bit different. So when you pressed mm -hmm. on certain levers, you got certain different outputs, right? Because the world was different. You had customers or whatever it is. You, and then now suddenly COVID happens. You're, in your home box now, <laughs> somebody took you out from the office box. The home box is very different because now you've got your kids running around, your dogs running around. You guys, all these things that are happening around you at the same time, you hit that sort of this virtual lever, you know, that's been created by your workspace, but the world is different. So now a lot of the customers are not responding to your, you pushing that lever. So it's a whole paradigm shift where it's created so much uncertainty and that's what it is. Like ultimately it just creates so much uncertainty. I mean, I, myself, I'm sort of going through a little bit of that myself with work because then I start thinking about like, Oh my gosh, like I'm, how am I, I'm not able to contact some of these people that I used to meet so frequently. Uh, and that's kind of creating a little bit of anxiety. So you gotta, <laughs> you know, that, that, that's what COVID does is it's starting to create, it's shaken up things so much is that it, it, you don't know, there is no level of consistency in what mm -hmm. you do anymore compared to the pre COVID days. Yeah. So it's, it's different. You know, you have to really, you have to really take it. So one day at a time and sort of see, right. How do I tackle this? Let me hit, let me work on this lever today. And then I'm going to work on something else, maybe another day. And well, that, that sort of thing is one day at a time. And I think from the standpoint of looking from a job, like even like the hitting the lever box, like you're talking about, we see a lot of people talking about how they apply for a job and they don't hear anything back from recruiters. And we used to be like, you at least applied for the job and you got some kind of notice that let you know they got your application. That's still kind of happening for the most part. But then you, you at least got told like, you're going to go forward or not. And now it's just kind of like, recruiters just disappear. Like you don't hear anything. Yes. Like it, the level yeah. has changed there again. So now you're kind of almost they're like, overwhelmed as well, right? They, right. They for them. Them. Right. Yeah. So it's kind of like, right. If I think of not that I'm the mouse in the box, but in this situation, I guess I am right. Like, do I want to send it again? Because I don't get a positive um, feedback from it. You and it's it. like, yeah, it's like getting nothing almost feels worse than getting at least some kind of correspondence back. Yeah. Okay. So I just said about, we were talking about how we've got like the braidness to send out the resumes anymore. Cause I don't know what's going to happen, but let, I want to go back to kind of stepping back to when this all very first began and like the giant dump on the Skinner box happened. And those of us who did get laid off, so I think probably everyone, it sounds like experience as you're saying, we have to remember that everybody experienced some kind of new lovers, which is a good perspective to keep that everybody's in a new, um, perspective per se, or Skinner box. Um, and so, 
like the the moments of those feelings and i think jim and i've talked about this with a couple other of our hosts like too like there's kind of some feelings that people go through it seems like maybe they go through i don't know if it's the same as like a death and dying grieving kind of situation but what what happens in the brain when um and i think too there's kind of two different things i think sometimes people know they're going to get laid off and then some people don't mm -hmm. even see it because you have a process to like if you know it's coming you maybe you start to like prepare for it coming up maybe you still go through the same grieving but mm -hmm. maybe it's shorter but then mm -hmm. some people have you know you don't have as much time like you totally get sideswiped by it so i think that's probably happened on both sides yeah. too of this situation so what goes on what should we be aware of how do we yeah, give ourselves so some grace too i think <laughs> Yeah, and, and and by the way, like so, I'll, I'll, you know, I, I came across this one study, and it was done in Germany, and where they kind of assessed like people's, you know, um, stress levels, um, and, and it was very interesting to me because, with respect to you know losing their jobs, and what was very interesting to me was so they asked they asked uh, pe one set of one set of uh, employees were actually still employed. So, so they were still employed. Another said already lost a job. Okay. And then, um, you know, and, 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 and what was very interesting there was, I think, which you, I think you just touched on, is that the level of anxiety and the sort of the fear or uh, uncertainty, the sort of negative feelings were actually more uh, a greater among the, the people who didn't know who are employed and, and sort of, didn't know where it was headed, then it was in the people that already lost their jobs. So that was, that's very interesting. It's like, well, listen, you didn't even, you haven't, you haven't even reached that outcome. You're still getting your salary. Yet, yet your fear is actually greater than the person who already lost their job. So it really speaks volumes to, you know, how, how incredible it is that our fear systems are. And so, look, I'll tell you, there's, there's a psychological aspect to this, and then there's, you know, the neural basis to this. And so I think let's start with say, the neural basis of it. Like, fundamentally, you know, you take, you take any sort of stressful event, and what it does is foundationally, I think what it does is really it grabs your networks of, you know, survival. So it goes, and, and, and this is a very... This is a very, this, this sort of, this place where it takes you in the brain. And when what, what you is, are, is it like that was a little piece back here, right? In your back it's, a, it's, the, it's sort of the reptilian brain. What's right? it called? So, so you can kind of, it's, it's kind of like this brainstem area, right? So that's, that's kind of like where it is. The more deep bottom? Than, no, what's it called? The, the. Well, the, the, well, the fear, fear bases would be like amygdala. Amyg or, uh, okay. I'm but, just thinking, I, sorry, I had this moment because Jigna liked TV. The thing about Young Frankenstein where he puts that clip back there and he uh, says, uh -huh. like he puts the, the, the um, scalpel in the guy's leg, says he won't feel it when he hits that little, but you know, that part. Oh, back there. Do I you see. remember yeah. that in part of the movie, Jigna? I, I don't remember. The I don't know what yet. you're talking about. You haven't seen Young Frankenstein? <laughs> I haven't seen it. Ooh. I know. We're I watching Young Frankenstein. You're coming over. I know. It's on my list. And every oh other movie that's gosh. out there. It's like, no, like but a I, classic. But anyway, he does this like thing and he says, you're not going to feel this pain. Like he's like blocking that brain part. And then he stabs right. him with the, in his leg with the scalpel and the guy doesn't feel it. And like the whole class is like, oh. <laughs> But yeah, yeah that's so right. and, and, it's that little and, and, primitive and brain. It, it is have. right, and and exactly, and primitive is is the way to to sing it. Like you know, evolutionarily, you you just go back to our ancestors, and you know when we were sort of in the wilderness, right? And you, you essentially all you uh, you okay, had one Okay, now job. I have to. I want to sing Madonna, and what is she saying? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so. I made it through the winter, right? Whatever it is. Okay. <laughs> you can add, you can make, make that, ed, put those edits in there. Yeah. You know, just, just, just Sorry. don't make me Sorry, the background Gina. dancer. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't make me the background dancer. Right? That's all I'm saying. Yeah. Um, but, but um, that's what it is, you know, and, and it's, it's a very, it's, it, it's, it's where, where our brains really started, right? It, it, it's, it's, it's fear-based and survival-based. And, 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 you know, you, you, you basically, you faced, you faced the lion or what have you out there. You, I mean, yeah, that's immediate, like, you know, I mean, shock, 
pupils dilate, blood pressure has gone up. Um, it, you know, let's anxiety goes up because you're afraid you're going to get killed. You're going to die. You're going to take care of your family, et cetera, et cetera. This is, this is evolutionarily still within us, right? That's the remarkable thing. Like that is still in us. Those are the same neurons and same networks that are still there. So what happens is that, you know, we come to this place where when someone dies or, or we come to a place where, you, you know, and it's, it's an uncertain outcome that happens. It's really, it's that uncertainty, um, unexpected, you know, outcome that happens. That's when you sort of just kind of have this like flush. And a lot of times people like kind of have these panic attacks. You just, you know, your body just like, it just has this like massive flush. You just like sweat a ton. That's your system sort of, you know, really, you know, responding in, in, in a way that, that it would when you face a lion that's about to pounce on you. Now, I think that, you know, a lot so of people- on. I want to ask you back yeah. up here. So kind of the people that are still at work with anxiety, I'm thinking instead of the lion, like I'm envisioning, they feel like they're stuck It was sharks swarming around them. Like they don't know when yes. the executives yeah. or the board or whoever's running the organization yes. is going to have to make that next cut. And so Correct. it's like, you're like stuck in a ring of sharks. And so how do you sort of, you know, uh, calm those thoughts and feelings and that pain that so you're you feeling? you turn the water you know? with your coworkers and you chop up. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> you, 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 Jennifer's yeah. got a plan. <laughs> just, you know, my little got a plan. Like, yeah. My little reptilian brain is going, hello, where's your... <laughs> um, I, I think that, I think that, I think, you know, the way I like to look at this is it's, um, when you from a from a found, neuroscience foundational perspective it's like a seesaw right so mm -hmm. on on one end you've got all these like sort of stress molecules right that's that's what's dry, that that's what where the weight is that's these like the stress hormone cortisol um and you know inflammation inflammation is is absolutely insane and like stress stress elevates inflammation and then it's got all these sort of downstream effects on the health of, mm -hmm. you know, your, your neurons per se, like, and so all that sort of stress and, and this sort of negative, you know, uh, flow of cortisol and et cetera, it makes the cells very unhealthy. So it makes every, every cell sort of have to work harder in order to just keep up with its, its goal of staying alive and staying healthy. And, you know, so, so, so it, this seesaw is that, you know, that there's that on one side. The other side is the positive stuff. The other side is, you know, brain derived neuro neurotrophic factor. So that's, that's something that's, that's a molecule that is, is good for the cells. That's a molecule that's trying to keep them happy and nutritious. Uh, and then you've got dopamine, you've got serotonin, which, you know, like, so antidepressants, essentially what antidepressants do is, is elevate your levels of serotonin. Right. So serotonin is sort of is this happy molecule. And so in your system, you know, you kind of, you hope that you kind of like a little tilted on the mm -hmm. positive side, right? right. That then, and you're, you're enjoying it and you're, you're, you're enjoying your job and everything's going well and all that. You're getting a lot of things from it. And then what happens is that, you know, you start, you, it's, you don't have to lose the job. Like you said, it's, it's the sharks that are swimming around. You kind of smelling something, you're sensing it, the water's move, moving right. That will do this. Right. I mean, well, you're going in and you still have your job, but you know, that's even the sharks this. that are swimming around though. Right. So they have that sense too. Cause I'm wondering, like you're talking about, like it's your health of your cells. Like how, how does it impact the decision-making of people in organizations who are higher up to who have to make decisions? Yeah. Um, I mean, and, and we see it all the time. Like you see um, politicians, they, they age really fast. Right. You see that with, um, and I've seen it with, the pictures I've seen of executives out there in the last, you know, from different companies that have showed up speaking one place or another, you start to see that they look like they've started to age in the last five months from trying to figure out how to, to keep this going. It's not easy. Uh, it's not easy for anybody. Um, you know, and, and, and I think it's, you know, we can, we can always make someone else like, we can always kind of put our anger towards them. Like, Oh, you know, he's an executive, like, Oh, what does he care? Uh, I mean, he, he does care, right? I mean, he, ultimately, 
for him, the company's well-being is is on his shoulders, and that person then mm-hmm. has to also answer to someone else above them. The bigger so shark. About <laughs> bigger shark. That's bigger it. Shark. You know. Yeah. Now um, I want to sing. Do, do, do. Sorry. Oh gosh. Yeah. So, so real going back to what you're saying around folks that are, you know, still working um, versus those who have been laid off. And it seems like the stress level might be a little bit higher for those who are inside the moat in a sense. And, mm-hmm. and how do you get out of that? And do you uh, need to get out of it for, for that matter? But, mm-hmm. you know, am I hearing like, okay, maybe I'm at a better place uh, than I think I am uh, being laid off versus those people who have a job in this sort of situation because of COVID and just the uncertainty? Well, no, I mean, I'm not, uh, I'm not saying that, I'm not saying that one's better than the other. The point is that fear is, fear can come from absolutely any, anywhere, you know, whatever your situation is, you can decide that I am going to worry about this. And, you know, if it was the case that, you know, people's positions or their wealth was securing them from fear, then we would see that, you know, rich people would not have any issues, right? right? You wouldn't see all, all these depression rates and suicidal rates and all these things happening to people who are extremely wealthy. So, so clearly there's, a, there's really no connection there. You can choose to be afraid and you can choose to, to linger in this sort of stress um, of sharks and, and whatever it is, no matter where you're, what your position is, employed so or not employed. Uh, okay, so there is a key word there that you were talking about, the choice, right? You can choose, and I hear that all the time. Um, you, you hear that with uh, therapists, you hear that with doctors, you hear that with um, life coaches, the choice. You And even your friends and everyone around you, like, oh, you can yeah. choose to be happy. And for all those people who are in dire need of money, right? The ones that may lose their home or... Um, their families or, you know, just some serious, serious life changing, altering situations um, because they don't have a job. And uh, how can one choose to be happy when you're yeah. the, way, the best way um, I can describe it? Some people in, in a situation where they're in the middle of the ocean and um, they don't know how to swim very well. And what they're doing is trying to stay afloat. And the minute they go up to get a little bit of, uh, you know, air, they get pushed back down and it's over and over and over and over again. And then how long can you do this before you just, you're exhausted and you can no longer go on, you know? So, right. so how, how, how does an individual have that choice? Yeah, look, it's, it's tough. And, yeah. and I, I've always, um, I've always sort of drawn it in a way where it's not as simple as, yeah, just saying that, yeah, you have, you have a choice. You can come out of this, come on next week. Yeah. Cause, yeah. cause it's a spiral. Yeah, it really is. And yes. if you don't, if you don't, um, at some point, if, 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 if people haven't been able to sort of come out of that, then they're going to just continue digging that and just going that deeper and deeper. And I think what I mean by choice is to me, it's that, look, I think make the decision that I, the way I feel here today, tomorrow, I'm going to feel, I want to, I want to, I'm going to try to feel a little better tomorrow. And, and I, I always think like, you know, in life, like people need to not make all these sort of long goals right? and get, get so caught up in like the long, long goal to say like, you know, I should be in that kind of house. Like I should have that kind of job by now. And I was just, they started to create all these goals. And all, the only thing those goals do are become reasons to stay unhappy. Mm-hmm. but instead yeah. I, I, I say that keep your, keep your growth more proximal, right? Closer to you where you're sort of saying that, listen, okay, um, I'm in this sort of situation. Something's bothering me. What is that one thing I can do tomorrow, right? Tomorrow. What is the one thing I could do tomorrow that maybe gets me a little out of this? Like, you know, because gets me to experiment your a little bit. Brain's- if I understand correctly, and now you're the neuroscientist here, right? So the brain will start to like 
respond to that? Because what I'm thinking about here is earlier you said something about like pain and people say like if they, when they were hitting the levers, like it's pain, I'm not going to hit anymore. So um, like five years ago, I did this crazy thing and decided I wanted to learn to run a marathon. In fact, I did it like a, I did a dopey challenge where you did four days, you did a 5K, 10K, half and a full. So it was 48.6 miles over four days. Um, if you could, I, I am, I still don't have a marathon body. Like that's not going to be what happened there, but, um, but there was people leaving me like, why would you do that? Like, and I will admit there's, there were lots of painful days, but it was about, okay, this week, if I could just finish three miles and then next week, if I could finish four miles on one time, one day and finish five, like, and then at some point my brain was like looking forward to getting out of bed and go running 10 miles. Like that sounded like a good idea today. Like, as opposed to like maybe two months ago, I would have told you hell no. So like your brain yeah. starts to go, I, there's a pain, but the reward is different in your brain. Like the body might hurt a little bit from it. Yeah. And that's yeah. different. Yeah. And that's a different, I mean, different level of it. Right. Um, and I think you, you make a good point is that if you come up with more, more incremental, you know, positive outcomes, but like there's just goal, kind of really small, small goals. Like I was telling my wife, my wife, my wife really struggles with um, staying consistent with her workouts. And so she kind of has this like, sort of like, she's really into it. And then she just drops the ball and then just like, you know, regains her weight and then is in despair about it. And, well, cause and we all gained yeah, the COVID-19, you know? <laughs> yes. That yes. And, and it's all, it's all very understandable. And, and I just think, you know, it's the, and then it, the, the hill becomes a bit difficult to climb up because yeah. as we were saying, you, you keep, you keep rolling down you can't, you know, I can't just go to say like, okay, come on, like the snap out of it. And then you can start, you can you just start doing it again tomorrow. And I've realized that, you know, what, what, what really a lot of the experts sort of tell you, it, it makes a lot of sense is that, um, look, don't aim for that 60 minute workout class, right? You're, you're, you know, you're at the bottom of the pit, come up with a goal. It's like, you know what, this week or this month, I'm going to do a, a, a three minute routine. So then, so I, as I told my wife, I was like, you know, how about you do this? Every time you wake up in the morning, do a 60 minute like workout or a 60 second workout, 60 second workout. Okay. And just do this for the next 10 days and let's see like how you feel. And, and I think that, I think that that's the way that, that folks need to sort of think about this is that don't be so hard on yourself. Like, I think that's, that's what gets people is that they, they're right. so hard on themselves that that and, and, it, and I know it, it gets them in so many directions. It's not just themselves, but they always feel like people are watching them and are expecting things from them. You know, like I have to have this kind of a lifestyle. Oh, yeah. and mm -hmm. I have to have this kind of a job. Wow. So that was some really good nerdy academic stuff for me. You know how I love that. Yeah. <laughs> the whole like thinking about Skinner, the box, you know, going back to the Pavlov's theory, mm -hmm. kind of bringing it back and then how that impacts our brain and our, our reptilian brain trying to take over our intelligent brain and um, just some things to be aware of, like why we may be feeling what we're feeling if we're employed or not employed or if we're watching a family member not employed or a family member who's still employed and really stressed out. Evidently, they're more stressed than those of us not um, working right now. So, mm -hmm. you know, um, it's, it's a little, it's, it's, it's mind blowing. It's, it's really cool. Cliche, yeah. But. And I want to continue having this conversation with Uncle Ray. I think it's really important and really relevant. Um, I think any one of us can take something out of it, which is the, the most important thing right now is uh, use this opportunity to maybe retrain that brain of yours. So we are going to continue this conversation on our next episode. I'm really excited to, you know, ha learn more uh, from Uncle. So you guys stay tuned for our next week's episode. Perfect.